and indescribable you are. We hold in our hands the word of God that you gave to men to share with us precepts and things that you wanted us to know. And yet, God, your word is simply a snippet of how awesome and how great you truly are. But we thank you that you are faithful to every jot, tittle, and iota in your word. You will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. It is our prayer today. It is our plea, O God, that you would show up and show off as only you can. We realize that in the world that has so much division, you've called your children to unify under the banner of Christ. May that be our prayer and our yearning today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your copies of God's Word and turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 31 through 35 this morning. I had the opportunity this week to take part in a state uh, tournament for basketball, state 3A tournament. Our Kirk girls, they hosted the tournament for many teams around the state. And who would have known? The Kirk girls won their, their girls' bracket, so we're very proud of them. But it was interesting this week. I got to know several of the coaches and other players on various teams. And one of the coaches, I really, I really thought a lot of him. He didn't yell at his players. He was very calm and complacent and seemed to, encourage his, seemed to encourage his girls. Well, in one of the games at halftime, his team was losing. As they stepped back onto the court, I just leaned back from announcing, and I said, Coach, good luck to you. And he said to me, well, we're going to need a lot of it. And I thought, you know, that doesn't sound very encouraging. It just didn't sound normal. Another man came and sat down by me, and he said, you won't believe what I just heard. He said, I wasn't eavesdropping, but he said, you know, I just went by the locker room of these girls, and I heard their coach say this, girls, we're not good enough to come back from this deficit. You can't score this amount of points. We're going to lose. Boy, that's a halftime pep talk, isn't it? He said, let's just try not to lose by 35. That's not good. (laughs) He had already resigned those girls to believe they were defeated. And man, you should have seen the looks on their faces when they came out of that door. They weren't, man, we've still got a shot. They were, we're gone. They should have gone ahead, packed up the bags, got on the bus and gone home. In one of my favorite movies, The Natural, it's a baseball movie starring Robert Redford. Redford plays the role of a fictitious baseball player named Roy Hobbs. And Roy Hobbs was this guy who had just an amazing ability to play baseball. Well, he was in a major slump. And his team was playing. The New York Knights were playing in Chicago. Well, it looked like he was going to strike out once again until a lady stands up. And this lady turns out to be a former love interest from his youth. Redford sees who it is. He straightens his cat back up and directly hits a home run. He found her after the game and said, I haven't seen you in years, but let me ask you, why did you stand up? And she said, because I didn't want to see you fail. I want you to understand today that as Christians, we should be standing up for one another. We should be building one another up and not tearing one another down. That's what God encourages us to do. In the heat of the battle, when things look their worst, That is when Christians are to encourage and build up one another. 
God has called us to be unified under the banner of Jesus. Now, would you look at the passage of Scripture in Acts today and stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Beginning in verse 31 of chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was what? was shaken. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. This is not some kind of a Pentecostal thing where, you know, God is just doing something. People get up and down and run the aisles. No, it's not that at all. The people of God are praying faithfully and intently and fervently. And God shows up. And he literally shakes the place because he is affirming their heart. In prayer. Have you ever been in a place where God shook the very foundation? The place where you were standing? Man, I long for that kind of a day. When you can say, man, I've been in the presence of God today. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice what happens when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak the Word of God with what? Boldness. Something here to note. In the book of Acts, whenever people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they always speak the name of Jesus with boldness. It doesn't mean they're out there yelling, but it means that they're not ashamed of their Lord and Savior. They're going to tell someone about Him and what He's done and is doing in their lives. Now verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. May God honor and bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. You know, I just want to stop for a moment. You know, as we were singing this morning, Worthy of Worship, the man who wrote that was Mark Blankenship. And having a dad who retired from the Baptist Sunday School Board, I knew Mark personally, and I called him Uncle Mark. But listen, when you sing songs about God and you realize that God is worthy of worship. Man, I want you to know something. That is awesome. And it is very humbling. And as Christians, man, when we worship, let's get excited. There are four things in this text that Dr. Luke, the author of Acts, brings out to the reader. The first is this. A call for Christians to be unified in prayer. The great evangelist Gypsy Smith, who ministered in the early 20th century, once said, take this piece of chalk, draw a circle, get in the circle, and then pray, God, revive everything inside of this circle. The church at this point in time was in its baby stage. It was in infancy. And yet, what do we see the church doing? Man, the church is proclaiming the name of Jesus. It's not ashamed. It's not worried about what the outside world thinks about them. How many times in the church today, which has been established now for almost 2,000 years, how many times are we concerned about what people think, how we talk and act about Jesus? Well, what if somebody sees me go down front and pray? Man, I hope they see you go down front and pray, friend. Listen, you don't need to wait to the invitation. If God so leads, you come during the music time right now. You get saved, get things right with God. You don't need to wait until the invitation. I've known too many people who have dropped dead in the middle of a service, never made it to the invitation. Former church where I served, they had at least two people die in the middle of the service. And I want you to know that ended the service. But you come. If God is dealing with you, friend, you come. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. 
is Acts 4.20. Peter and John, apostles of Jesus, his disciples, they've been arrested. The religious leaders say, you guys need to be quiet. You don't need to say anything about Jesus. In verse 19, they said, well, you decide whether it's right for us to do this. But listen, as for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard. What a beautiful testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we didn't read this verse today, but I want you to look at verse 29. For when they prayed, this is what they prayed. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants, literally, your servants may speak your word with all confidence. These Christians, these born-again believers, they said, Lord, we want you to know we're your servants. We're here with you. Whatever you need, wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do, Lord, we're yours, even if it leads us unto death. They rejoiced in their salvation. Following God and His will was primary to them. It was of cruciality, meaning it was important. They go on and say, Lord, don't simply just help us to to be servants, but help us to speak. Have you ever felt like you're not smart enough to talk to God? I felt like that. You know, I've known people when they pray to go back to the old English and say thou and thee and thy. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand, that's not how the disciples prayed. These guys were uneducated. A part of me wants to believe the disciples spoke with a little country accent. And said, Lord, it's me, Peter. But you know something? You don't have to have an education to talk to God. You don't need to try and impress God with your knowledge of the English language. When you pray, God wants you to be real. You know, the Bible tells us when we don't know what to say in our speaking, that the Holy Spirit gives up groans to the Father in Acts 8, 26, that our mouths cannot even express. My wife says there are things that I express she wishes I wouldn't. Prayer is simply talking to God. A third thing they ask God for is confidence. I've met grown men in life who say to me, Pastor, I don't feel confident. I don't feel comfortable praying in public. I just can't pray. There are people who don't have confidence in their prayer lives. There are people who don't have confidence in their worship. There are people who don't have confidence in themselves. There are people just like the coach I shared with you who don't have confidence that, you know what, the local church can do anything for Jesus Christ or that God can do anything of significance in their lives. You know what? The church prayed for confidence to pray and to serve God. And God showed up and He gave them boldness. Do you not feel like you can do something that God can use you? Pray for confidence. Say, God, give me boldness to speak for you. God, give me boldness to live for you. If you look back at the 11 disciples, and I'm not including Judas, because at this time Judas is dead, and add one more making 12, Matthias. Matthias is chosen in Acts chapter 1. If you look at these 12 men, they didn't have an education amongst them. But God wasn't concerned about what they knew. God was concerned about who they knew. And God used who they knew to make them tremendous witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this upcoming month in March, we're going to continue our 12-month emphasis on friendship loves. And while we always want to love one another in new beginnings, our emphasis in March is on prayer. And you're going to see up here at the front and also on the back today our 31-day prayer devotionals that your staff has written and we've given to you. To spend time with God. I encourage each one of you to take one today. 
If we don't have enough, I'll be glad to print some more. But these devotionals have been prayed over and thought over to encourage you to walk closer with the Lord. Also in this month of March, we're going to be having our time of revival. Dr. Bill Oakley, former pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church, one of my fathers in the ministry. Bill is going to be here and have a revival time where we focus on the Word of God. And that's going to be the 19th through the 22nd. We're going to have a time on the 18th beginning at 10.30 that morning where we have a 24-hour prayer meeting here at Friendship Baptist Church. I'm going to encourage and challenge each of you all to sign up for a time. I don't have a sign up yet. But some of you may say, Brother Brian, I don't feel comfortable coming to the church at 3 a.m. You know what? If you'll commit to pray at 3 o'clock in the morning in your home, if you're on the road, if you'll commit to pray, praise God. You don't have to be here to pray. But Friendship Baptist Church is to be a church, a people of prayer. I'm reminded of the story that's told about an African tribe where there were many converts for Christ. And they would go off in the woods to be with, be with the Lord. And you could tell where they had been because the paths would be trampled on and the grass would be down. Well, when the grass started to grow on one of the paths, the other brothers would go to that brother or that sister and say, I just wanted you to know there's grass growing on your path. Meaning that they had not been spending time with the Lord. I think many of us have grass growing on our paths. But God is calling us today to be unified and pray. Would you commit to the Lord this week to pray? Would you commit to Him to pray for five minutes a day? Maybe ten minutes a day. Because God wants to hear from us. Luke also encourages us to be unified in our hearts. Now Paul says in Philippians 2, 2, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, being intent on one purpose. Founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, says about this passage, This means their loves, their hopes, their passions are joined. But you know, it's difficult in a society like the one in which we live. It's very difficult to be of one mind because there's so many different agendas. But you know what makes a football team great? It's not that all the same players play the same position. But that all the players have the same goal and purpose in mind, and that is the end zone. Or to stop a team from advancing to the end zone. Have you ever heard an orchestra where everyone simply tries to play the same note? What makes an orchestra beautiful is that there are many different notes that are being played by different instruments, but they're playing them to the same song or to the same tune. The same thing can be said about a choir. Not everyone sings bass or alto or tenor. And I've been hoarse, and I'm pretty hoarse today. But it's that when we sing, we sing various notes, and when you put them together, man, it makes a beautiful sound for the Lord. But you know what, when it comes to singing, it's not the sound God's concerned about, but the heart. And here Luke says, the Christians were of one heart. You see, they knew they were a marked people. And if they broke rank, the enemy was coming against them, and he would pick them off one by one. Everything they had was used to the furtherance of God's kingdom. Whether it was their money, whether it was their possessions, their time, even their own lives, whatever they had. Look at the end of verse 32. No one claimed that anything he had was his own. Man, can we do that? Do we do that? There have been some that have said, well, Luke was just thinking about a utopian society. I don't believe so. I believe that the Bible says exactly what was happening in the lives of these new believers. That people were so excited, so humbled, so broken, so blessed to be saved under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That everything they had, they said, Lord, it's not ours, but it's yours. Take it and use it for your glory, for your kingdom, that others may know exactly the same joy that we know today. Man, that ought to be the heart of the New Testament church today. 
but it's hard. And it's very challenging. In the Old Testament, a story is told about King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah had become sick. And there were emissaries from Babylon, a neighboring nation that came to wish him well. And King Hezekiah had prayed to the Lord to spare his life, and God said, I'm going to spare it for a few more years, 15 to be precise. But he said, I'm so glad you came. Let me show you all that I have. And so Hezekiah began to show them all of his storehouses, all of the gold, all of the silver. And you know what happens when Hezekiah dies? Those emissaries in that nation come back and they take by force the things that Hezekiah showed to them. You see, Hezekiah struggled with something that you and I often struggle with as well. Too often we brag about our stuff instead of bragging about the greatness of our God. And that's where we should get our joy. Because all the stuff we have is one day going to rot. It's going to go away and turn into nothingness. But man, the treasure we store up in heaven will never rust or go away. Third, we are to be unified in a personal witness. Now, it was obvious in the church that there was life change. It was obvious. The outsiders knew this. They knew that they were not acting like the normal world. They wanted to know what was different. And guess what? The church told them what was different. Jesus is different. The Bible says when they told them people got saved, they got right with God and they wanted to become believers too because they wanted what these Christians had in their own lives. These believers didn't simply believe one way and then act another. Have you ever known anybody to do that? Hell, this is what I believe, but that's not how I live my life. They believed that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And as a result, that death had been conquered, the consequences of sin eliminated, and they could be born again and have life everlasting through his name. And they wanted other people to know that as well. That's why in the Old Testament, God tells the people of Israel, I want you to be a light to the nations. You bring people who aren't in the fold. You bring them in because I want them to be my people as well. We can't get away from this idea of personal witnessing. I was talking to one of our men at the state convention two weeks ago. And he shared with me, you know, Brian, we're looking at revitalization of church planning, but we really want to focus in Mississippi in some church revitalization. Could you give us some ideas? And try? We talked a little bit as that's part of what I, I do in my degree. And... He said, there's one of the churches in Mississippi that I talked to this past week, and this is what they told me. Well, sir, we appreciate you for wanting to help us, but listen. We have ten people here, and we're very happy. When the ten of us die, then you can get somebody else to close the door. You know what they were saying? These ten people were saying, and this individual is a representative of these people, were saying, we're not a New Testament church, but we're part of a club that calls ourselves a Baptist church. We're not interested in proclaiming the name of Jesus to anyone else because we're happy where we are and who we ha- with who we have. And so when we're done on this time of earth, fulfilling our own desires, then you could come, close the doors to this physical building we call our club, our church, and we'll be good and gone to glory wherever we are. You know, something tells me that's just not why Jesus died. That's not the power of the cross. Man, listen, we ought to be telling people about Jesus. People aren't running into the walls of the church. Several reasons why. I don't have to go into them. You know. Man, when they see our lives, are our lives different than the lives of the world? Are our lives changed? Are our lives transformed? I want to tell you something I've learned about Grenada, Mississippi. There are a lot of people in Grenada that want to talk about Jesus. But I can tell you this, your pastor doesn't want to talk about Jesus. I want to be about Jesus. There's a difference. And if you want to be about Jesus Christ, that means that you're going to be about commitment. You're going to be about sacrifice. And you're going to be about his kingdom and his things. 
Not about playing a game. We have too many people in our society to play a game. And guys, I want to tell you one day, there's going to be an end game. And we're going to stand before God and have to tell God why we played a game instead of live for Jesus. Too many people tell me, preacher, I'm okay with Jesus. Jesus didn't die for me to be okay. Jesus died for me to live victoriously. The church has a great story to share. That's what the entire book of Acts is about. It's about evangelism. People coming to faith in Christ. Do you realize that without the book of Acts, the New Testament makes absolutely no sense whatsoever? We don't see the uh, ascension of Jesus Christ except in 1 Corinthians 15. And we see it in Acts 1.8. We don't really understand what happens. Where, Where did Paul come from? But Acts is perhaps the most critical book in all of the Bible and its focus is on telling people the good news about Jesus many years ago in 1949 a man named John Currier was found guilty of murder he was sentenced to prison after he'd been in prison for a while his uh, his location was moved to a work farm outside of Nashville Tennessee his his prison sentence was terminated in 1968. Why? I have no idea, but it was terminated. Well, life for Mr. Currier was very hard on the farm, and letters were written to him, but he never received the letters. And so 10 years after this letter was written, this man continued to work. The man who owned the work, the farm, the man who owned the farm, he died, but this man continued to work until one day a parole officer in Tennessee found out what was going on. He went to this man and said, look, man, here's the letter. You're free. Your debts have been forgiven. I want to ask you, what would you do if someone sent to you an important message and year after year that message was never delivered? Man, I want you to know today, God is delivering His message to you. The message of hope, the message of renewal, the message of purpose, the message of joy, the message of forgiveness, a message of reconciliation. And friend, it's all found in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, who has been risen from the dead victoriously. Oh man, do you know Him personally? Would you come today? And you know something? If we've been given the message, God has given us that letter, and He says, pass it on. Pass it on to others, for they also need to hear The message of my son. Fourth, New Testament believers were called to be unified in meeting needs. Listen, believers in the first century church, they emptied their pockets. They emptied their homes and their absolute lives to minister to the church family. Now, these people in the church family were people in need. But these were not people who abused a system. They weren't people who spent their money on frivolous items. They were people who genuinely loved the Lord but just had a very difficult time making ends meet. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. If you are a child of God, Friend, whatever your need is, God is capable and willing to meet that need through the power of His Son, Jesus Christ. He is able. But as we talked about last week, do you trust Him? Do you trust God is able? I close with this. Many years ago, there was a movie entitled Spartacus about a Roman slave who started a rebellion in the Roman Empire. Well, eventually the rebellion was crushed and the leaders brought together. In the movie, it shows this as they're just in an open area. And one of the Roman leaders says, All right, point out to us Spartacus and the rest of you, we'll treat you better. There was silence. Until one man who was not Spartacus, Spartacus was played by Kirk Douglas. One man stood up in the back and said, I am Spartacus. 
And another man stood up and said, no, I am Spartacus. Another, no, I am Spartacus. And one by one, each of these men stood up and said, I am Spartacus. Even though they were not, they were willing to pay the price. For being Spartacus. Friends, may Friendship Baptist Church always be a church that stands for the cross of Jesus Christ. May we be a church that supports one another by being unified through prayer, through personal witnessing, through our hearts, through meeting needs. May we always yearn to accomplish the purposes of the kingdom of God. I'll even share with you something I've talked to about with our associational missions director. I've talked about planting a church here in Grenada. Because there's a very specific type of church that we don't have. And there's a people group who needs a church. They need not only a place to worship, but they need to be the body of Christ. We need to be about evangelizing the lost. Because you know what? Without the cross, without the cross we're nothing. We're nothing. You see, years ago, in approximately A.D. 26 or A.D. 27, on a day in either March or April, most likely, when a guilty young man by the name of Brian Robertson stood guilty before God because of sin, No one else cared. No one else thought of him. But there was one, Jesus Christ, who stood up. And he said, I am Brian. And Jesus died on the cross. The innocent Lamb of God so that a guilty sinner could have the opportunity to experience forgiveness, life everlasting, and life as God created me to live through a relationship with Him. But you know something? Jesus didn't simply just stand for me. Jesus stood for you. He stood for every person on the earth, even those who would curse his name. And he said, I love you. And I'm going to give myself for you. Friends, there's no greater gift or joy than humanity has ever been given except through Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know him here? This morning you have an opportunity to respond. Perhaps you've thought about knowing him for a while. Or maybe like so many others, you've done a good job of playing the game. But today... You know in your heart that things aren't the way they need to be. But you can't do anything about it. And yet Jesus can. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to make certain today where you're going to spend eternity, in just a moment I want to invite you to come forward. I want to talk to you what it means to follow Jesus and give your life to Him. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus died for you, friend. He died for you. Would you come today 
and say, Jesus, I want you to live in me. You may need to come to the altar and talk to the Lord. You may need to intercede for some friends in your life that you know are not saved. Some family members who are lost or maybe not living for Jesus. You may have a boss that you're not best friends with. I want to tell you, Jesus died for all of those people. The altar is open to you today. Would you come and pray for them? Lift those names up before the great throne. If you've been looking for a church home and God's led you to friendship, I'm not a perfect pastor, and this isn't a perfect church, but we serve a perfectly risen Savior. And I tell you something, it's awesome to have a desire to see people saved and to grow in faith. And that's what God has called us to be as a church. And that is our heart at Friendship Baptist Church. To worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Would you come today? Whatever God is leading you to do, you be faithful. Would you pray with me? Brother Ken, would you come? Oh God, this time is yours. Lord, do with us what you will. Forgive us of sin. Lord, I believe there are people today who need to make a decision for Christ. The Bible tells us whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Lord, may your spirit move in a sweet and powerful way. And may we say yes to what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand this morning and respond to the Lord?